uh, this one thing, if we understand this one thing, we would get a lot of other things right. And perhaps the number one thing is to cast down pride and to build up our humility. So this sermon will address all these things if we really believe this with all of our hearts. If we really know this to be true. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, we see the story of Mephibosheth, how he was mistreated by Ziba. In verse 24, And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed, until the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, <coughs> my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he has slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. Now you can tell from this story that what happened is that Mephibosheth's servant, Ziva, deceived him, tricked him, and you'll notice that three chapters behind, and we'll look at that a little later on, how Ziba lied to King David that Mephibosheth did not want to meet King David while he was under distress because Mephibosheth wanted the kingdom for himself. Mephibosheth, when he later caught up with King David, he told him that my servant was lying, but do whatever you think is good and right. If Ziba gets everything that I own and you want to take that from me and give it to him, that's perfectly fine too. Notice how he elevated King David, but how much he debased himself. Why is that? Because Mephibosheth said, I was from a family where we would have all died anyway. We should have been dead a long time ago. So what right have I to cry anymore to the king? John the Baptist said one of the most enlightening quotes, which has been uh, almost one of my life verses, actually, is John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. John 3.30. <clears throat> he must increase, but I must decrease. That has been one of uh, almost my life theme verses, but 2 Timothy 4, 7, 1, so I use that one. But John 3 has been one of my life verses where Jesus Christ should be exalted and lifted up, whereas us, we should debase ourselves even more. If you think you're going through a hard time, to be quite honest, we should debase ourselves even further and go through harder times. Now, uh, that's hard for us spoiled Americans, see? We're very privileged and we think that we deserve this, but to be quite honest, you and I don't deserve it. What's very dangerous in our minds, which is why I hate Laodicean apostasy so much, which is why I preach so hard, kick apostate Christianity so hard, especially the scholars, is because I hate how spoiled we've become, how selfish we became, how much we think that we deserve even more when we don't. We deserve much less. We deserve much less. What you have is not even what you deserve. It's much more than what you deserve. It's much more than what you and I deserve. As a spoiled American, in my flesh and in my mind, I am no exception. I can fall into that mentality where unfairness, where covetousness, where jealousy, where bitterness, where discouragement, where depression, tiredness, and a million excuses can land in your head, and it's very easy to have an Elijah mentality, Elijah mentality, in spite of what God has blessed your life in spite of what God has blessed your life. 
It's time that we get out of our own selves, our own TV show, and we have to give Jesus Christ the spotlight and realize how little, how insignificant we are. How little, how insignificant we are and how much Jesus Christ deserves more. But at the same time, it gives us more gratitude when we realize how much of a spotlight we received. How many blessings we received when we don't deserve it. How we could have died, but God has given us life. How God has put us on top when we don't even deserve to be there. How blessed we are, how much more privileged we are compared to other people here. Understanding the mentality of debasing yourself and uplifting God on recognizing how good God has been to you, how much he blessed your life, it gives you the epicenter of joy. When we think about songs like Sinner Saved by Grace, think about this. Why is it a song like that meant something to us when we were singing? Why did it mean so much to the audience? Because how much we finally debased ourselves and how much we uplifted Jesus Christ that he would save a scumbag like you and I. Why do words like, how could I boast of anything I have seen or done? How could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? Where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place? I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. Why do those words mean to you? You ever thought about that? Because you put yourself down. You recognized who you are. You recognize what your rightful place is. And it's not where you're sitting right now. You should have been in hell. You should have been worse. Some of you should have been the one out on the street. One out on the street. But then it elevated Jesus Christ at the same time in that song on how he saved you. How he delivered you. And then blessed you with so many victories. <laughs> so how dare can you claim that as for your own? Now, you see that why a song like that means so much to you is because he must increase, I must decrease. If this is our epicenter in our minds and we believe it with all of our hearts, your life will truly transform. Salvation should have transformed us, but it only transformed our soul, not our outward flesh. But what it should have transformed you is Wow, how unworthy I was, and he saved me from hell. I mean, the very least I could do is give him everything that I've got. And everything that I've got is still not enough. See, it, it should have changed us. It should have changed us to do something like that. But in salvation, all we're thinking about is selfishly saving our own hides and our own skin. See, we all we're selfish about is, I don't want to burn in hell forever. I want to go to heaven. See, all we are is we have a selfish mentality, but there's no gratitude there. No deep, no deep concern, no deep thought into our salvation moment. Salvation should be something where it should transform our whole life, change our whole perspective, and our whole life should be humility and servitude rather than just give me, give me. So I hope that this sermon can be very helpful to you there is one character who fit the best that I found many gleanings on. He must increase, but I must decrease, and that is Mephibosheth. He realized what he was, a dog, a dead dog, and David meant everything to him, meant everything to him. That's why he was able to be happy. He was content if King David gave all of his property to Ziba. He would still be content. But if this happened to you and I, then we would be bitter, we would be upset, we would think it's on fire. We would question why God. See, um, I want us to understand Mephibosheth a bit more, and perhaps it can change your perspective and mine. Will you pray along with me? Now, Father, this is a very difficult sermon because uh, it's not something that can be delivered or explained well. And I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray it'll become crystal clear. Your Holy Spirit will speak to them. Speak to us loud and clear. May it transform and change our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us start from the beginning. Let's go to chapter 4. Let's start from the beginning, chapter 4. In the life of Mephibosheth, we know that 
he was crippled and he was lame. But didn't you know Mephibosheth's name means a man of shame? Man of shame. That's what Mephibosheth means. And also, didn't you know that wasn't his name before? Didn't you know that? That wasn't his name before. If you look at the book of Chronicles, his name was originally Meribah. Meribah. What is Meribah? One who is against Baal. Now, that's a, what a title that this is, a, this is the guy. This is the guy who opposes Baal. This is the Bible believer right here. This is a guy who will stand for the truth. This is a guy who won't compromise with sin. This is a guy that deserved every blessing of God because he is the one who opposes Baal. Man, what a guy, what a guy, what a guy. But he became more famously known as man of shame. Man of shame. How did this happen? You go to how he was raised, how he was raised. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Notice that his name is connected to that time when he was crippled. Not when his legs were high and he was lifted up, but when he was crippled, he became known as man of shame. Ever since the age of five. See, when he was five years old, I don't think that he can recall all those memories where people bow down and respected his position and his authority. You are Meribah. You are the one who opposes Baal. You're a special guy. I don't think he recalled that at all. I don't think he recalled those times when he was eating at the king's table, eating such good food, luscious food, delicious food, and then everybody just gave him a plate of food all the time. I don't think he would recall that. I don't think he recalled the times where he was probably athletic. He was probably very gifted. He could run faster than anybody at his age. He was a gifted child probably climb on top of things. And then other parents were like, wow, this man, he's going to be a skilled hunter. He's going to be a great warrior. I don't think he recalled those memories that time. All he recalled was that time ever since the age of five when he got crippled from running away from the Philistines was, where's the king? Where's my father? I don't see them. They're not here to give me, give me. I'm on my own. I have to work for a living, but how can I work? My legs are crippled. Who am I? I'm not Maribal. I'm the one with shame. After all, all they see is a cripple on the street, a guy who can't fight any battle, a guy who can't do any work, just sitting down and associated with shame. Somebody has, to, somebody has to cook the food, give it to me. I can't do it myself. Somebody has to pick up stuff for me. I cannot pick it up myself. All he remembered was being helpless. All he remembered was being crippled. All he remembered was, I'm not a big shot. It never dawned on his mind, I am the son of Jonathan, so I deserve the throne. Far be it from that, he can't recall that, he can't remember that, even if people told him that, he don't remember experiencing that. All he ever experienced was shame. I wonder if that's why when he was brought up before the throne at David, and David said, you're going to eat at my table, uh, Mephibosheth never said, well, about time, I've been waiting for many years, where were you? I don't think Mephibosheth would say something like, hey, that kingdom originally belonged to my family, to me, not to you, David. No, he never said that. He never said, well, about time somebody remembered the covenant. David, you made a covenant with my father, so why didn't you rescue me from this situation a long time ago? No, he didn't. Why? Why didn't he give answers like that? Why didn't he give complaints like that? 
because he never experienced royalty. He never experienced pleasure. He never experienced comfort. So that, those things never dawn on his mind where he would complain to David, give me comfort. No, all he ever experienced was pain. All he ever experienced was shame. All he ever experienced was being the bottom. So that's why he saw himself to be the bottom. And then when David took him up, put him on the table and gave him food to eat and said, I will make you as one of the king's son. Mephibosheth, rather than thinking that, well, this is expected, he instead was mar marveled. He instead was amazed. He said, I don't deserve this. Why would you look at a dead dog such as I? He never said, I'm the son of, I'm the grandson of Saul. He never said, I'm from a royal bloodline. He never said, I'm the son of Jonathan, who you swore the oath to, so you should do that. No, he said, I'm a dog. I'm a dog. Because he remembered ever since youth. All he could ever remember and experience was pain and low life. Do you know why people in Malawi, Africa, will get saved by the hundreds and will be happy for Bible-believing truth and a Bible in their hands rather than you? Because all they ever experienced was pain. All they ever experienced was poverty. All they experienced was, I'm just a dead dog. All they ever experienced was no air-conditioned homes, no comforts, no cushions, no, nothing to give me, give me, like this American mentality. They never experienced that ever since they were young. All they experienced was, I'm just low. I'm a nobody. Who's going to pay attention to me? And then Somebody opened up the word of God and said, Jesus loved you enough to die for you. Jesus will pay attention to you. You can be the child of God. You can know Bible-believing truth. And these people in Malawi, people in persecuted countries, will grab these Bibles and kiss it. And these people will bow down and take a Bible and say, thank you so much. I mean, why is that? Because now, now they realized, wow, why would I be special? Why would God give this to me? How undeserving I am. Thank you. I am truly a sinner saved by grace. But not us Americans. Not us Americans, we think that we should be a Bible believer. That it's a given that when we have salvation, God should give his promises. My God shall supply all your needs. All things work together for good. That if I suffer, I should reign with him. He should reward me. And No, th that's not a given. Do you understand that? You know why? Ever since from the age of five, someone fed you. Ever since the age of five, someone gave you comfort. Ever since the age of five, your favorite word was give me. Every time you went to shopping. Ever since the age of five, it was given that your parents, your family should treat you very well. It was a given that you should have a job because this is America. They should have a system where you can have a job, where you can have a, enough of a affordable money to live and have food, and that's your problem. Ever since the age of five, you've been used to comfort. You've been used to prosperity. You've been used to being spoiled. And that's the reason why when you sing a sinner say by grace, it don't mean that much to you. When you sing these hymns, I, you know, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, nothing but the blood of Jesus, that, that, they don't mean anything to you. They're a given. Come on. It should be expected because ever since the age of five, I was saved. I grew up in a Bible-believing church. And I have the King James Bible, and that's why you're so unthankful. You have no gratitude. You're miserable. You're sad. Because the mindset of yourself is, give me more. I deserve more. You think that God should deliver you from your suffering? No, you should experience it more. You think God should bring you down from the bottom, uh, take you up from the bottom? No, you should be there a little longer. Be there a little longer until your stubborn flesh can rewire its brain and its feelings and learn what it's like to suffer true suffering, poverty, and being in the bottom, and that you are truly a man of shame. A man of shame. Until you can experience shame, until you can experience how low down, how unworthy you are, then perhaps you can learn to be thankful for what God has done for you. Let's look at 2 Samuel 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9.
Look at Mephibosheth's response when he was brought before the throne room of King David. In verse 6, verse 6, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Now notice your King James Bible, every punctuation is important. Notice that exclamation point, behold thy servant. Did it say period or exclamation point? It's an exclamation point. Why? It shows an excited emotion there. Now, Jehovah Witnesses, they believe in the importance of punctuation because in their uh, book where Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God, in our King James Bible, we put that period there, but the Jehovah Witness Bible puts exclamation point. You know why? Because they know that exclamation point changes the whole scene. They think that Thomas, when he said, my Lord and my God, in exclamation point, that he was just simply going out of shock. Oh, my Lord and my God, when he saw Jesus. No, in the King James Bible, it's a period, my Lord and my God, because Thomas recognized Jesus to be God. So notice that even the Jehovah Witnesses realize how important that exclamation point is. What's my point here? It's not just Mephibosheth saying, behold thy servant. There's a meaning here. When he says an exclamation point, behold thy servant, he was afraid. He was afraid to die. I mean, notice right here the next part of the verse, verse 7, and David said unto him, fear not, fear not. Why? Because Mephibosheth was afraid. He was afraid that he was going to die. He didn't come up with a period when David said, Mephibosheth, and then Mephibosheth said, Behold thy servant, like as if he was indifferent, like as is if nothing's going on. No, he went up before David said, Behold thy servant, because he was scared that David could kill him because he's from the family of Saul. Because he's such a dead dog, he's full of shame, he's unworthy. You know, Mephibosheth is not like many of us Christians where God says, Gene, and then you go, behold, my servant. That indifference, that used to feeling, that when God would call us that, hey, me and God, you know, we're okay, and then you take that liberty even more where God hath not given us a spirit of fear but a power, love, and sound mind where we started to abuse it now and we abuse our liberty as if we can complain about anything to God and we deserve more and God should answer this prayer because it's important to you. Behold thy servant. What about... What happened to this? You might say, why should I fear the Lord? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, it's true that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind, but we've abused it where we go off balance and we forgot our healthy level of fear. Not paranoia, but a healthy level of fear. Shouldn't you be afraid the way you're living? No, you're not. You're not. I mean, you got to recall what you are afraid of from the Lord, and then maybe, if you were to think about this way, how real hell is, how scary hell is, think about pitch black darkness. You ever been in the dark before? You ever sleep well in the dark before? All right, if you're scared of the dark, imagine it's pitch black, and then you feel the air, something creeping all around your skin and your hair, but you can't see it, you can't tell, and then all you feel is pain. You ever burned yourself before? There are people who have burned skin and they can't stand the pain after burning their skin. After burning themselves, their whole body, they cannot stand the pain that they just want to kill themselves. Even after being rescued from a fire, even after being rescued from the fire, if their skin is all burnt up, they're in pain. They can't stand it. Now imagine that fire burning from head to toe, 24 seven, you cannot rest. I mean, is there no fear of hell? No fear of hell before your eyes. I mean, because, you know, I, you're so used to not seeing fire. You're so used to being in air-conditioned homes. You're, you, you're so used to whining about 90 degrees outside or 100 degrees outside. 
and that you deserve air conditioning in your car. Otherwise, you throw a hissy fit. And then that's your problem is that we've lost our fear of hellfire. We forgot what it was like to be saved from hell. We forgot what it was like that God, you, do you realize what happened to you? You got saved from hell. Do you know why people run and shout when we sing, I'm not going to hell? You know why they're very happy? Because they were afraid to burn in hell forever, but somebody got them out and they don't have to go there anymore. But when you lost your fear of hell, now you're thinking that your salvation should be a given. The only thing that matter, should matter to you and I is being saved from hell. We don't even deserve a home in heaven or the beneficial blessings of God, that 200 plus promises of God. Just being saved from hell is good enough, but it doesn't mean that much to us. We want more. We want more. You know why? You weren't that scared of hell. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. You know what you and I should do? We should take a trip to hell, stay there for about five minutes. Then when we come out of hell, let's see what real gratitude is. You know who, who are the most happy people? People who were afraid of something bad happening to them, but they got saved from that. But if they're so used to a life of no fear and extreme liberty, then what happens is they get depressed so easily and they expect something more. You know what you need? You need a, you need a crisis in your life that would scare the hell fire out of you and then if God saved you from that, you'd be the happiest person for the next 10 years of your life. You know who tend to be the most, most thankful about salvation? Those who are afraid. Those who are afraid what could have happened to them, what would have happened to them, what they've been through. And God saved their hides and got them out of there. Do you realize that God is seeing what you're seeing and that he's feeling what you're feeling and then the thoughts that you're thinking in your mind, he's, see, he's thinking that too. And then all these wicked things in your flesh that God is living inside you that it's a miracle and it's a wonder you and I didn't drop dead yet. Oh, uh, pray for my health to get better. Oh, I wish that God would do this better thing for me. Uh, with the body, you got, you and I are lucky you're still breathing. Come on, that's right. You know what happened? You lost your fear of God. Fear of his holiness over his wrath over the sins that you and I commit. And you can put on a good show as a Bible-believing Christian, but God is seeing and feeling and hearing every single thing inside your body for he lives there and you lost your fear of God. Do you realize what's inside you? Your heart of hearts? That's the creator of the universe and all he has to say is drop dead. You drop dead. God, why would you, why would you live inside me? Why would you be sealed to the day of redemption? And why would you not kill me yet? Why would you give me breath to keep preaching? And then it makes you more thankful. It makes you more happy. It makes you stop picking on things where God should do more things for you. You know why I'm scared the most? Sometimes more than hell. Sometimes more than the devil. You know who I'm scared of the most? Myself. Do you know what you and I are capable of? You and I are capable of? When the push comes to shove and the devil pushes the right buttons, the ugly parts come out of you that you never thought that would come out of you. And that demonic side just comes out and then you've already done the damage, you've hurt some people, you've hurt situations in your life, and you can't reverse those things. You know what I'm scared of the most? Myself. I hate myself so much. I'm scared what I'm capable of. I, I really want the rapture to happen, not just because I want to see Jesus' face, but I don't know what I might do tomorrow. And I'm so scared, but you're not. You're not. You think that Every day, you can decide what you want to do. And then everything's a given. But let me tell you something, my friend. With 
with the kind of weakness that I have in my flesh and God can use me today to preach his word, you don't think that I'm thankful? You don't think that I'm glad? You don't think that I'm, oh God, thank you so much. Why? I, I'm so scared of myself. Do you know how many times God covered my back even with my mistakes, even with my faults, even with my sins? Do you know how many times God covered my back, still used me, forgave me, and then... Uh, isn't it amazing? No, you don't remember those times, those stupid mistakes you made because you never made a stupid mistake. No, you don't remember those times when God covered for you, when God still used you, and even turned those mistakes into something good. So you lost your gratitude and you think that God should give you more. And when bad things happen to you, you think, woe is me. Oh, bad things are happening to me. What happened to your fear of the Lord? Do you realize you are a walking miracle right now with the mistakes that you made, the fears that you should have over yourself, and God prevented you from falling into certain sins and into certain consequences and certain things? Do you know that I could have been the one this close to be the one holding a sign on the street saying, I'm homeless, give me money, and I use that for drugs. Do you realize that? No, you and I don't realize that because we live in America far too long. And we think that because we're stinking hardworking Americans, we worked in a degree and we got a diploma, that this is a given. But it was God who protected you from yourself, Amen. made you born in a home where it doesn't have to be a broken, drugged up home, where God brought you to this church, where God has given you people in your lives, God covered for you. He covered for you, man. And you're not thankful? You're not really grateful to God? You and I were this close to be dead, to be the guy holding the sign on the street, to be the one cussing out Jesus Christ. You're not afraid of yourself, what you're capable of becoming and doing. And God prevented that from happening to you. God shielded you, man. Oh, the gratitude. The gratitude and thankfulness. Lord, thank you that I was born in a Bible-believing home, raised in it, new doctrine. Lord, thank you so much for shielding me away from the world. Let's look at verse 13, 2 Samuel 9, 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Can you picture being Mephibosheth sitting at the king's table? You're lame on both feet. Uh, king David, you got me at the wrong table. David said, no, you're at the right table. I want you there. No, David, you don't understand. I'm the guy who's crippled. You know the cripple guy? The guy whose name is Shame? Do you remember that? You got the wrong person at your table. And David said, no, exactly. I wanted the guy who is associated with Shame, the guy who's lame, to eat at my table. Did you notice that the Holy Spirit made sure to mention that? Made sure to mention that. It did not just say in verse 13, he did eat continually at the king's table. It added... He was the one that was laying on both his feet. Why? God saw something beautiful with this crippled position that he wanted to put in there. Do you realize that? Now, if you and I were to look at all of our broken things, our crippled things in our lives, you remember you were the one that said, no, I can't be the one to preach. Me win a soul? Not in a thousand years. I don't know how to lead a soul to Christ. The Lord will... Will the Lord answer this prayer? It's going to take a miracle if he answers that prayer. You remember those times? And then remember how God answered all of those? Remember how God put you up and you thought you were totally incapable and then God just made you capable? Just took you one year in this church and then you started to make strides that you thought you'd never commit or accomplish before. You remember that? You remember that? You thought you'd never do it. You know why? You remember your cripple. You remember your cripple. 
and you're like, no, I can't be at the king's table. No, you got the wrong person. That's Gene Kim. That's Gene Kim. He's the guy, you know, with the talent and with the skill. It's, it's him, okay? Let him do all of that. I don't know how to do song leading. I'm horrible. I sing off key. It's, it's Gene Kim and all that. You know why you said that? Because you're a cripple. You remember you are lame. And isn't it amazing how God took your lame state and put you up and put you at the king's table? <clears throat> you know what? God said, I want that one. I want that one. Well, Lord, uh, all I can bring to you is five loaves and two fishes. Lord, I only have two mites as a widow. This is all I got, Father. And God's like, exactly, I want that. That's precious to me. Do you understand? Precious. Precious to me. You remember that parable about the rich man who sold everything he got for just one pearl? God said, yeah, for that little thing, I gave up everything for that. That means a lot to me. But it's broken, Father. And, Father, and the Father says, that's exactly what I want. I want your broken things. Isn't it a beautiful thing? Aren't you not glad? Don't you remember, Mephibosheth, your crippled state? Or did you forgotten your crippled state, Mephibosheth? Do you remember those crippled things where you thought that you weren't talented to do this, where you're not able to do that? And God has used that broken personality of yours, that broken character of yours, those broken skills of yours, that broken experience of yours, that brokenness in your life, and turned it to something beautiful where now you're accomplishing great strides for the Lord that you thought you never accomplished for the Lord? What's that? The Lord taking the broken things. And it's a priceless gift to him. You know why you get moved at the song, I Stand Redeemed? Even at my best, I am unworthy. I have nothing precious I can give. A broken life, a broken life. A broken life is all I have to offer. Yet, it's a priceless gift to him. You don't remember that? You don't remember that? And you can't thank God for that? Nah, you... You're too high. You don't see your crippled state. All you see is the king's table, and you're eating. And because of that, all you're looking at is the king's table right here, right here, eating. You're not looking at your crippled legs. You can't see it. Because all you see is the goodness of God. All you see is the accomplishments, the fruits, and the blessings that he's given to you, and you can't see your crippled legs. You know, I think it's while you're eating, it might be good to... Don't you think it might be good, my favorite chef, if while you're eating, you once in a while, once in a while, you look down at your legs? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I still got that problem in my flesh. Yeah, I still got this weakness. I remember five years ago, yep, that was me. Boy, that was stupid. Man, this sure tastes good. This sure tastes good. This is wonderful. Wow, this sure tastes good. But no, you, you don't see your leg, Mephibosheth. You're just, oh, this is good. You know, I want more. You know, it could be better. Lord, why aren't you answering my prayer? Oh, Lord, I'm going through a hard time. Woe is me. And it's about time you kind of get your eyes off the blessing a bit. Look once in a while at your crippled legs and then learn to appreciate the food you eat at the king's table. Maybe song leading will mean more to you now. Maybe participating in church will mean more to you. Going out soul winning on a hot day will mean more to you. Maybe using whatever broken talent you got to sing or to play an instrument, play a piano or a key, or to teach little kids, or to preach on the pulpit, will mean much more to you now. Is our church doing this? And hogging it down, hogging it down, hogging it down. You forgot your legs. You forgot what God patched up your broken legs and then now used you for something great? Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 16. Chapter 16. 
Ziba, he's very much different from Mephibosheth. He wanted the possession riches that Mephibosheth had. If you look at uh, verse 1, And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and a hundred bunches of raisin, and a an hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. Why would he do that? Because of verse 3. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertain unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. What a crook. This is a guy who lied to David about Mephibosheth, and Ziba, he wanted the blessings. He wanted the goods of his king. He wanted that for himself. But in order to do that, he had to bring in a lot of raisins, a lot of figs, do a lot of good service to the king, and through those efforts, the king will reward him on something good. You know, Ziba... You know what his problem was? Listen, this might be the most shocking to you. Ziba's problem, if you look at verse 1, Ziba the servant. You see that? His problem was he was so lost in servanthood, servitude for his king that he actually became prideful, not humble. What do you mean by that, preacher? Hey, Ziba, you remember? Oh, hey, uh, brother, sister, how are you doing? All right, let's pass out a hundred tracks right here, 200 tracks. Let's wash the feet of the disciples here because I'm a servant. Where's my thank you? I never got thank you once. Pastor never recognized me or followed up with me. God, uh... Shouldn't you be blessing my life? Here am I. I'm a teacher. I'm teaching the word of God to our people and preaching. And you never blessed me. Lord, uh, shouldn't you, because I served you in this? No, Ziba. Ziba, your problem is, is that, you know what the servant's problem is, Ziba? Is that the worst thing you can do after all that service is, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Here you are singing, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, crying and then, you know, pretending you're humble, acting like you're humble, being a servant, when deep down inside you got pride in you. You might say, I do, pastor. Yes, the difference with you and Mephibosheth is that Mephibosheth didn't recognize himself to be a servant. He recognized himself, I am a dead dog. You know, we're so lost in being a servant of Jesus Christ, I think it's about time we see ourselves as a dead dog. Servanthood is too high and lofty a position. Do you understand? I think that's our problem. We treated the servant of the Lord, which should be a position of humility, which should be a position of serving other people, which should be a position of unselfishness, and we've turned that into our own selfish, prideful gain that, yes, I'm the most humble servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's about time you and I should see ourselves not as a servant, but as a dead dog. Why? Because you should have died. You know what a dog is? In the book of Peter, a dog returneth to his vomit, having his still weaknesses, fleshly issues, and sins. I think you got to look at that. Not as, I'm a righteous servant of Jesus Christ. You're my soul winning for Jesus, and... No, you got to look at yourself as a dead dog. And then perhaps your gratitude and happiness will show forth even more on why God would even bless a dead dog like you. Amen. But a servant, it's expected that the master should give me something. You know what Ziba said at verse 4? I humbly, no you're not, Beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight. Do you see that there? What did the Bible say about humility? God giveth grace to the humble, right? You know what he's doing? 
He's saying that you should find grace in me. I'm humble, God. I serve you because I am humble. I am humble, God, and I serve you because I've done this much for you. You should find something good in me that I've done for you. Remember all this service that I've done for you? I washed the disciples' feet. I've served others. I, I'm one of the best members in Pastor Kim's church. I've done so much for the work of the Lord. And what, 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 see, me again. Like God should find something good in you. Uh, let's be honest. Why don't you concentrate on being a dead dog? Amen. You know what Mephibosheth did? He didn't see himself as a good person that he could boast. When you look at chapter 19, chapter 19, when he met David... He wasn't telling David, oh, uh, remember all this that I served you. You're going to find something good in me. You're going to find grace in me. And so I am a humble servant of the Lord. No, he didn't do all that. You know what he said? Verse 28, Mephibosheth, 28. For all of my father's house were but dead men. Saying in Samuel 19, 28, for all of my father's house were but dead men. What right, therefore, have I yet to cry any more unto the king? Mephibosheth recognized who he was. I'm just a dead dog. So I don't deserve any more. If you put me to death, too, or if you put me aside, I actually deserve that. Why? Because he focused on his dead dog state. You got to focus more on your dead dog state rather than all the good things you've done as a servant. That's why you're unthankful. So God should answer your prayer. God should bless your life because of what, servant? Because of your good thing? How about all the things that you've done, you dead dog you? How about your sins? How about your mistakes? How many times you let God down? Especially if God is living 24-7 inside your body, huh? Why don't you focus more on your mistakes, on your sins, and what a dead dog you are rather than being a humble servant of Jesus Christ. Then perhaps the light bulb can click and your eyes can open a bit more on, I don't deserve anything good. God, why would you bless me this much? God, I am so thankful to you. You know why you still got that bitterness? You still got the jealousy? You still got the complaining attitude? You still got your false humility? It's because you look at too much of your good rather than your bad. You got to look at your dead dog state, the bad you've done. And you realize that if God even answered one of your prayers, that God is such a good God. And he don't even have to answer all of them or even half of your prayer requests. You know, that song, it says, how could I boast of anything I've ever seen or done? How could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? You know why that, those words mean a lot to you? You're focusing, you're dismissing, you're dismissing all the good things you've done. And you're just elevating Jesus Christ. It's only his goodness, not my goodness. Can't you do that? Can't you do that? Look at 2 Samuel uh, 19 again. 2 Samuel uh, We'll look at 21, excuse me, chapter 21. Chapter 21. Samuel chapter 21. Huge difference here, all right? It'll kind of throw you off a loop. It did throw me off a loop a little bit too, okay? So let's just read uh, 2 Samuel 21, verse 8. 2 Samuel uh, 21, verse 8. But the king took the two sons of Rispa, the daughter of Ea, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and who? Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together. Whoa! Now, when you read that one, you'd go, oh my goodness, Mephibosheth just got killed. Actually, you just read verse 7. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Then the Mephibosheth he killed was verse 8, the two sons of Rizpah. There were two Mephibosheths. <laughs> Close call, right? <laughs> 
throw you off a loop over there. Yeah. You might go, man, my favorite shit got killed. No, no, there was a huge difference. The huge difference, there was only one line that made the difference. Mephibosheth was this close from being hanged. He could have been confused as the other Mephibosheth, you know? No, 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 I ain't the one, I ain't the one. How do we know? You're Mephibosheth, we're supposed to hang you. No, no, I ain't the one, you got the wrong one. How do we know? Verse 7, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord. Do you see that? It was only because of the Lord and that oath, the Lord's oath that David Jonathan made together, Mephibosheth was spared because of the Lord. But he was this close from being hanged if it weren't for the Lord. Lord was not there. What would have happened to Mephibosheth? If the Lord's oath was not there with David and Jonathan, what would have happened to Mephibosheth? He would have died too. You talk about being unfair. Can you, think, can you picture that other Mephibosheth? I'm not the one who's crippled. I'm the one who did more good. I'm the one who did, who's more apt and able. Well, what makes this Mephibosheth better than me? He's the crippled one. I'm not. You're right. There's nothing except because of the Lord. Mephibosheth, do you realize how many versions of you are out there in the world that could have been your lives? Mephibosheth, you don't recall that, do you? Whenever you're out on the streets, do you see a little bit of yourself in that other individual who's lost in drugs or in sin? Do you see a little bit of yourself in that person when they said, no, I don't want to track, and then they spat on you, and then did it dawn on your head that could have been me? Mephibosheth, do you see that there were literally a hundred different versions of you out there of what you could have become? Mephibosheth, think about people who died in your life. Mephibosheth, think about people who died in your life. And that could have been you screaming, weeping, gnashing your teeth in hellfire right now. Hey, Mephibosheth, you are this close. There's only one difference between you and them. Because of the Lord. That's the only difference. You're right, it is unfair. When you see those people out there, they should be the one serving God better than you. They should be the one who have gotten saved. They should have been the ones giving their lives to Jesus. They should have been the ones blessed by God. But why you? That you talk about total unfairness. And there's no gratitude after that. There's no thankfulness after that. There's not, why me, God? Lord, thank you so much. What happened, Mephibosheth? Because of the Lord, that's the only difference. Last thing I want to close, and then uh, we'll call it an end here if we go to 2 Samuel 19. 2 Samuel chapter 19. The Bible says at verse 24, verse 24, And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. Wow. Verse 30, 30, And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. Mephibosheth, he gave the most uh, amazing statement. He said, let Ziba have everything that I have. As long as you come home in peace, that's all that matters to me. You see, uh, the riches, the blessings of David wasn't that much to Mephibosheth compared to the king himself. Mephibosheth, he didn't enjoy the table of the king, eat his food, enjoy his riches and blessings, Mephibosheth, he refused to dress himself, the Bible says. He refused to trim his beard. He refused to enjoy anything good of the blessings of David until David came back home in peace. That's all that meant the world to him. But when he came back home in peace, you know what Mephibosheth said? <laughs> let Ziba take all. Let, let him have it all. The king's table, the food, the blessings that you've given to me, let him have it all. Because I got what I wanted. 
you came back home in peace. That's all that I ever wanted. You know, instead of treasuring the blessings of God more than God himself, we ought to realize that we ought to treasure God more than his blessings he's given to us. And the problem with Laodicean Christians, why they're not at home, why God is not home in peace with them in their hearts, and Jesus is knocking on the door of their hearts and he is not at home in peace with them, is because that Laodicean Christian said, I am full, I am rich, have need of nothing. I got all the world at my fingertips. I got all of this. The blessings, the prosperity that you've given to me, God, they mean more to me. And because of that, they've, their Christian state has gotten cold. You know, your promotion has gotten you colder, Christian. You know, God answering your prayer has gotten you colder, Christian. You know, your, your pay raise has gotten you colder, Christian. You know, all the blessings that God has given to you that you and I don't deserve, you know, this Bible-believing church to even exist here, has probably gotten us cold, Christians. It's gotten us so cold that we're so full, need of nothing, and here is God knocking on the door of your heart, and you won't let him in. Can you truly say, Lord, you can have everything. I mean, take away everything. Like Job said, the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Lord, you can take away everything. All I need is you. If all I have is you, I've got everything that I wanted. But the world has wrapped its tentacles around us. And because of that, ungratefulness has increased. Discontentment has increased. Complaining has increased. Bitterness has increased. And we've lost our home until my Lord the King can come again home in peace. Really? Or is the Holy Spirit still grieved inside your home? Is he still knocking outside the door of your heart? Are you at peace with him in your heart finally? Finally? You know, Mephibosheth, he would not touch the blessing of God or any worldly thing until the king got home in peace. But a lot of you, you're going to touch your blessing. You're going to touch your world. You're going to touch your job, your school, your mundane worldly things to do in the world life again before the king would come home in peace in your heart. As soon as this preaching's over, you're going to touch those things and the king is not at peace with you in your heart. You know, I would, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, really, really, Mephibosheth, will you open your eyes and realize that I was a dead dog? This king meant everything to me. He died for me. He saved my soul from hell. He's given what I've got in my hand and I don't deserve all that. And now I'm not at peace with him. My walk is not right. My relationship is not right. My heart is not fully settled on him. Oh, I, I am not. I am determined not to go home, not to get off this altar, not to touch the world, not to do a single worldly thing until the king is at peace at home with me. With me again. But no, you Laodiceans won't give that cry. You'll let him knock still outside the door of your heart after this church is over. And you'll still go back to the world, Laodicea, and be lukewarm. With every head bow and every eye shut, 